Whenever the term restructuring is used in Nigeria, be it in a political party or a national discourse, it assumes confusing connotations and is always laced with ethnic and religious innuendos, begging the question, can a country divided against itself stand? Well, joining us this morning to speak on this topical matter following calls for ethnic sovereignty from different quarters and several headlines in the news this week is Olufemi Lawson, who's the executive director at the Center for Public Accountability. After which, hyperrealist Silas Onoja will tell us all about the relevance of art in society. And then comedian Shoei Brown will share details on why he believes he can change the narrative of Nigerians in America through his Netflix comedy special, Nigerian American. We'll also give you a global update on the fight against COVID-19 and review newspaper headlines from across the country. It's going to be all that and a whole lot more today on The Morning Show. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. The report of a committee set up by the People's Democratic Party, which recommended the scrapping of its zoning policy, was rejected by the Southeast and South South leaders, who said they remain irrevocably committed to the emergence of a Nigerian president of Igbo extraction by 2023. Well, this comes on the heels of several groups publicly declaring ethnic nations and calling on the United Nations to extricate their people from what they describe as the contraption called Nigeria, begging the question, why is Nigeria still so divided along ethnic lines after 60 years of independence in almost every strata of society? Well, here to speak on this and more is Olufemi Lawson, who is the executive director at the Center for Public Accountability. Femi, it's great to speak to you again. Good to have my namesake on the show once again. Morning. Good morning, morning to you. Well, here's the thing. We know without a doubt Nigeria is ethnically diverse. If we look at uh, recent or who knows even if these numbers are the most accurate, but we know that roughly we have around 250 different ethnic groups alone in this country. So why do you think that de desires for an independent state along ethnic lines is, is such a threat to the establishment? Well, we are witnessing what is currently being witnessed in Nigeria today as a result of the faulty foundation you know, that Nigeria today is built upon. You know, if you look at the principles of nationhood that was established by the founding fathers of this country, pre-independence and immediately after the independence, you understand that the country has completely deviated from the part of nationhood that you know, it was established upon. Today, we have a country that is not only divided along ethnic, ethnic lines, along religious, and other you know, biases. And what that tells you is that the foundation is faulty, the center is no longer holding, and the injustices have become so rampant. And until we begin to address the root cause of these agitations, which is mostly inherent in our constitution, then we may continue to have not only the type of you know, call for divisions that we are having today, but we may have smaller units you know, of the countries making such demands and such agitations if we don't quickly address you know, what has brought us to this point where virtually everyone does not feel you know, belonging you know, to the country any longer. The sense of injustice, you know, lack of equity and fairness you know, is so visible now. And I think one way to address that is going back to our constitution, going back to address issues that have become you know, faulty in our foundation as a country, Without doing that, no amount of force can suppress what we are currently witnessing. All right. Uh, the PDP committee, as you heard in my introduction, review of the 2019 general election headed by Bauchi State Governor Senator Bala Mohammed had recommended that the party should allow all aspirants from all parts of the country to contest for its 2023 presidential ticket. You know, some Southern uh, leaders have dismissed the recommendation and they've called it a hatchet job, right? Pandef also condemned the recommendation. They described it as irrational and inconsistent with the extant provision of the PDP constitution on zoning between the North and the South. Now, they claim that it will be suicidal for any of the registered political party to field any Northern candidate 
for the 2023 presidential race. Now, what is your take on that? I mean, is it really going to be societal? See, see what, what that committee, that, the Bala Mohamed committee, the recommendation is a typical reflection mm -hmm. of the, even the constitution of the country itself. You see, when a party cannot obey its own constitution, you should be rest assured that such political party, even when given the larger authority, will not even respect the constitution of the land. That is why today, a lot of people in position of authority clearly violate the dictates of our constitution without any regard to the feeling of the people, without any regard for the, to the spirit of equity, justice, and fairness. The constitution of PDP is very clear, section, uh, section 72 or thereabout, about the principle of rotation and zoning. And even if you want to look deeply, rotational principle as you know, contained in the constitution of the PDP and some of these political parties, is not even a North-South dichotomy thing. If in fairness, for a country that has been geopolitically zoned and across this, the North Central, you know, Northwest, North East, South East, South West, and, you know, and the South South South, should, of course, be conscious enough to understand that power sharing you know, has to be detailed, power sharing has to be holistic, rotational principle has to be you know, upheld in a clear term. But today, there is an attempt you know, by a group of people within that party to, you know, short, to, to pass through the shortcut to grab power again. And it tells you that you know, even the party itself does not respect its own constitution. And not only that, it, it, what has happened is part of the reasons why we are having the kind of agitation you are seeing in the country today because a lot of sections of the country are feeling sidelined. A lot of them are already feeling you know, unjustly abandoned in the scheme of things. And, you, this kind of situation will begin to give birth to more of uprising and agitation. I think the PDP should have been decent enough to respect you know, the dictate of its own constitution, which recognizes the principle of you know, zoning and rotational. The, why is the party zoning as an elected position into its part, political party offices if it, if it feels anybody can contest? Why has the party been you know, zoning you know, key positions in government if it feels anybody can contest? And I think it's quite insensitive for a party that is in the opposition not to be cleared enough you know, to actually consider the feeling of a region that have, of course, been one of the major you know, pillars of their party. Though I'm also not of the opinion that uh, the presidency of the country or right. the party ticket be donated to a particular region. Of course, the region itself must show willingness and preparedness. As I speak with you this morning, I don't think even in that party, PDP, I've not seen any serious presidential candidates you know, coming from the Southeast region, where this agitation is coming from today. That's the truth. You haven't seen any. Yeah, no. but do you think that that could be a byproduct of feeling disenfranchised for so long? Because if you're saying that merit over ethnicity should be the only prerequisite. It is quite noble. Definitely, there's no uh, cause for discrimination across ethnic lines. But when you look at uh, and take a deeper look, you understand that with us being so ethnically diverse, naturally, groups are going to feel sidelined and marginalized if they don't see themselves represented in politics, most especially presidential politics. So when it comes to a situation like this, where the PDP is saying that uh, despite the fact that we might have dibble dabbled in zoning before, we're not going to do it this time. Surely, with us all being Nigerians and understanding the connotations, the Igbo populations, or perhaps the South South populations, are naturally going to feel as though their politics don't represent them. And naturally, that could be the reason why we're seeing so much unrest, so much cause for succession. So, why do you think there is so much, it seems, agitation to give? or perhaps level the playing field in this way? Because if we're talking about uh, ethnicity shouldn't be a prerequisite for you being chosen as a candidate, we have to also understand that certain groups have been able to dominate certain positions in politics. So if this country is truly supposed to be reflective, why can't we level the playing field so that the South-South populations feel represented in, po in politics that affect them? You see, the point we have now, if you look at the progression from 1999 till now, you understand that the principle of zoning has been entrenched by the major political parties in deciding the choice of their candidate for the election. And it is one of the things that have been used from 1998 to stabilize the polity. The truth is that we cannot wish away zoning, irrespective of how much more we are seeking merit in determining who occupies political position in Nigeria today. For a country that is so divided, 
like we have today, for a country that is, you know, existing on a constitution that is so faulty and is not making the system work, such considerations, most importantly, like the ethnic factor, have become part and parcel of the process. And I don't think it is even at this time that the tension is so much that we should wish it away. It may be counterproductive for any of these political parties. But if it is the wish of the majority members of the party, you know, to zone their presidency to, but I think the party should, of course, be just enough to obey the dictates of its own constitution and, of course, consider those zones that have not been able to produce candidates, you know, for presidential elections since 1999 in determining, you know, who becomes their candidate in 2023. But the issue of merit is quite important, but for now, I think it may not be sensitive enough. And the truth is that there is no region in Nigeria, no region in Nigeria that cannot field a candidate that has the capacity, you know, when you even talk about merit in this country. Well, I think the question more is, is it responsible for any party to field a northern candidate? But I'll, we're going to go on a short break now. And when we come back, we'll continue on this conversation. Please stay with us. back to the morning show. We're still in the studio. Still in the studio with us is uh, Femi Lawson. Now, Mr. Lawson, before we went on a break, we were talking about whether or not um, it is responsible for any party to fail a, a northern candidate. Now, you know, social a cultural organization, Ohane Zendigo, argued that some highly placed Nigerians who have benefited so much from the unity of the country would be inclined to decisions and actions that would further inflame passions of the aggrieved part of the country, the Igbos. They say Nigerians agreed on the rotation of the presidency between the North and the South, in which this case is now, I mean, the president's, after the president uh, Buhari's uh, tenure, uh, it should be done. Uh, how do you react to this? If those people who were behind the principle of rotating the presidency from north, between North and South have been conscious enough, I think they would have gone further by microzoning the presidency then to go around the six geopolitical zones that have been recognized by the country. Why we are where we are today is because people are trying to manipulate the North-South dichotomy, you know, further by even removing the possibility of a north-south, you know, presidential zoning. If we have been careful enough to agree to microzone across the six geopolitical zone, this question may not be arising today. But the truth still remains that even two years to, you know, a general election, I think a region that is serious about, you know, running for the Nigeria, like I said, it will not be donated. It, it is power is not given anywhere. The zone itself must show readiness for this task. The zone itself, by this time, should have been propping up candidates that, the, because it is not the Southeast alone that will vote, even if the presidency is zoned to the Southeast. And you must understand that elections are not going to be contested by these two major political parties, the PDP and the APC. So the region must go further by advancing its course, by pushing forward candidates that are sellable and are marketable to Nigerians that will, be, that will appeal to the support of other geopolitical zones, particularly the north, three geopolitical zones in the north and the two other geopolitical zones in the south. Without doing that, I don't think the south is, will have to sit back and be waiting that Nigeria presidency will be donated to them or given. It is not served. The, the, the region deserves Nigerian presidency in the interest of equity, justice, and fairness. It is time, in my own view, and it, the time is ripe enough for Nigeria to have a president of Igbo extraction. But it is not going to be given until the region itself comes out with candidates that are sellable, you know, and that can appeal to the conscience of other regions across the country. That is the way to get it. It is our wish that, of course, in the, like I said, in the interest of equity, fairness, and justice, that this region is also allowed to produce a president for Nigeria. But I don't think it will be, it will be given without you know, doing the necessary thing. And we, the, the party, must, the, the region rather, must begin to look beyond even what PDP and APC may decide and appeal to the conscience of the larger population of Nigerians and other political parties who are also going to be in the race, you know, for them to have this aspiration. Come to materialization. That is the way I see it. 
That being said, it does seem to be populations and people in those regions who have already begun to look beyond their political parties or the two main political parties and have begun to look beyond Nigeria itself and, been, and have been calling for their own country because they feel as though the time is right or the time has been right. Even if we look as far back as Biafra and its legacy on Igbo peoples, it has resulted in generations of Igbo people having to start from scratch and continue to feel disenfranchised by their own politics. So so that being said, naturally, you can understand why the federal government don't want that to happen, because as a country, a country as diverse as Nigeria, if one ethnic group wants to break away, there's nothing to stop any other ethnic groups breaking away. I'm sure we're going to start talking about the, the Yoruba calls for succession as well. But further to the point about the federal government, when I'm talking about wanting to maintain racial or ethnic ethnic harmony rather, there's also calls or perhaps criticisms that people say that the federal government don't want these regions, especially in the south-south, to break away because should they do that, they'd be taking control of Nigeria's resource wealth and therefore disabling Nigeria in this way. Do you believe that that is the main motivation behind the federal government's push to keep United Nigeria united? No, it's, it's, I think uh, it's, it's an argument I've been advanced mostly by people who are lazy, you know, who do not really deeply understand the potentials inherent in virtually every part of this country. If the South Side decide in future to break away from Nigeria, it does not mean an end to the survival of other parts of the country. Today, we have a country that sits on a number of natural resources that are even more profitable today in the global market than the crude oil. That is just about $70 per barrel today. But the laziness that our constitution has encouraged is why it looks like, no, we must not allow this region to break away because the survival of the, the, survival of the country should not depend on any region or state. The survival of, the, of a country should depend on the potentials that are inherent in the federating unit. And that is why I will continue to fault the constitution that has made Abuja the, the, you know, the landlord over states that are feeding it. It's very unfortunate that today states have become so weak despite their potentials because you know, every 30 days they have to wait on Abuja because, before they can run their state. I don't think it is the availability of natural resources in some of these places where people are threatening you know, to break away that is forcing the federal government. Of course, there's this impression that, of course, we are better when we are united. But the truth is that you cannot force unity and you cannot force a marriage. We must build every unity on the principles of equity, fairness, and justice. Nigeria has presently constituted, particularly with the, by the dictates of our constitution, is not promoting unity. It is not just the division has been championed by those ethnic champions or groups that are advocating for a breakaway. But even the state itself is, has not been promoting national unity. If you look at the mode of appointment in this country today, if you look at the way ad, uh, governors operate even at their local level today, you realize that even when you eventually achieve the regional breakaway that they want, then you go back and start you know, fighting the battles of your region, then you start fighting the battles of state. So I think it is better that we sit together and agree on how we can collectively run this country in a way that we ensure that equitability of what we have, in a, in, a, in a way that we ensure justice for all citizens, in a way that will not make one part of the region look superior to the other. If we are able to do that, I'm very sure that these agitations will naturally subside. But if we don't do that, we cannot continue to use the force of, in, of the states to, to hold people together. It may lead to an implosion uh, in future, yeah. but it's better we sit on a round table and agree on how we continue to govern ourselves. And the first step that must be taken is that constitution that looks like the basis of this marriage that does not guarantee equity and fairness to all regions of this country. And we, if, by the time we're able to address the faults that are inherent in that constitution, naturally fairness will come to play. There will be equity, and people will naturally, you know, agree to live together as one nation. Now, uh, you have faulted the, you know, constitution. A lot of people would say, you know, it really boils down to restructuring, which everyone has been talking about. I'd love your uh, reaction to the declaration of the Yoruba nation by activist uh, Sunday Adeyemo, popularly known as Sunday Igboho, and also the call from the Middle Belt under the ages of the Nigerian Indigenous Nationalist Alliance for Self-Determination that petitioned the UN to extricate their people from what they described as the contraption called Nigeria. 
the action of people like uh, Sunday Bo today are products, you know, of the failures of the Nigerian state, whether you like it or not. The truth is that when government becomes so important and not responsive enough to the demands of the people or to the yearnings of the people, then you find characters like Sunday Bo emerging, you know, and making positions on the on, on, on behalf of the people. The truth is that today, Sunday Bo is not, in my own view, qualified to speak or to take such a such magnitude of decision on behalf of the Yoruba people. The truth is that whether you like it or not today, they are traditional, you know, traditionally recognized you know, Yoruba leadership institutions. We have our tra Council of Traditional Rulers. We have the Pan-Yoruba Social Cultural Organizations like Afeni Ferry. We have today you know, a cultural institution headed by somebody like uh, uh, Chief Ghani Adams, the area on Kakafo, that are recognized institutions that come together in most cases to champion the cause of the Yoruba people at the national stage. But today, because there is no you know, responsiveness to issues that ordinarily or the citizens are yearning for, then you find people like Sunday Go emerging and making such declarations. And I think it's of no effect as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, because the truth is that even after the declaration, you can see how unpopular such is. But I think it is not enough for us to just dismiss it, but rather the country should use that moment to address these questions that are being raised, well, not only by characters like Sunday Go. Thank Bo. you so much, Mr. Lawson.